Howdy folks, Dave of Chaos Crafting here. Welcome back. I assume you're here to see us finish this epic cliff face. In our part one video, I had just finished gluing together 16 layers of foam. This is the top eight layers. And our next task that we're gonna jump right into is going to be applying texture. Yep, aluminum foil. Easy peasy, just roll into balls and use it to create some awesome texture on foam. Grab your coffee or your adult beverage of choice. This part takes some time. There's a lot of surface to cover, but it really helps change foam into stone. The texture will catch paint break up light, and it looks cool. But like I said, sit back, this, this is gonna be a while. Now you can be as aggressive with this as you like. Now actually being more aggressive at this stage is best, because you're still going to route it a little bit to cover up some of the uh, serious striations and you're going to apply a several coats of paint so you're going to lose a little bit of texture give it a good press when you're pushing the aluminum into the foam Aren't you glad I didn't make you watch an hour of that? But here's what it looks like up close. I like it. It works. This will catch paint well. Next, we're going to move into some really fun stuff. The fiddly bits. This is where I carve out some uh, stalagmites and stalactites and start to really detail out this cliff face. I do have a, a quick video on how to make stalactites for scatter terrain. It, the same process is used here. I'll, I'll try to figure out how to put a link up in one of the corners or something. I'm also going to uh, glue some just plain old rocks. You know, they would be boulder sized. Yeah, the rocks I got from outside, they're gravel pretty easy find. Hot glue your stalactites and stalagmites in artistically posed positions. You know, whatever that might be. You'll notice I'm applying hot glue to both the top of the stalactite and to the side so it attaches in two places.
I switched to tacky glue for some of the smaller rocks because it's kind of difficult to get a tiny rock with hot glue on it. Things did not go well from here. I thought to myself, self, you know what this needs? This cliff face needs sand. No, no, this cliff face, does, it does not need sand. Do not do what I'm about to do. I thought I'd be slick and use a large Tupperware container, put it underneath the cliff, catch any of the excess sand. The sand had other ideas. It went everywhere. Hey, don't get me wrong, the sand looked great. If you've got a workspace that lets you get sand everywhere, go for it. It's an awesome effect, but nah, not, not for me. Typically, I'd use wall spackle for this, but I couldn't find my jug of spackle. I did find uh, some sandless grout that I used in my last kitchen remodel. It's inexpensive, does about the same thing. So I'm using this to fill some of the uh, gaps and uh, cracks in the cliff face trying not to lose too much of the te texture. I'm gonna minimize some of the severity in the striations. Again, not too much. I want the layers to represent distance markers. As I was doing this, however, I quickly realized that if I wanted to make a, a display diorama, this grout technique could make very realistic looking rocks. I could completely remove the striations with application of the grout. Apply the grout to your desired taste. Cover up as much of the striations as you like. When you're done, this is going to need to dry at least a couple hours, if not overnight. Now we're priming with matte Mod Podge. This is a standard way to prime and protect XPS foam terrain. I've mixed this Mod Podge with, with black paint, 50-50 ratio. Now this is, this, this is the cheap hobby paint. It does a good job of putting a, a protective varnish on top of the foam that you can then uh, paint on. Yeah, don't skimp on this part. When we're done, we're going to coat everything down with a spray varnish. The spray varnish I use will melt unprotected foam. So give it a, give it a few coats. It's the cliffs of insanity. Yeah, this, this, this is a big piece of terrain. Huge. It's hard to appreciate all of the texture right now. It's black, it kind of all blends together. 
Next, I will go ahead and start to paint it out and bring out that texture. Alrighty, on to the paint. So this is an inexpensive craft paint, a good earthen brown. We're applying it with a damp brush technique. You're not trying to put a full coat. You're brushing lightly across the surface, catching all of that texture. Vary your brush strokes from left to right, up and down. This is going to represent the earth mid-tones. My process for painting terrain includes layers of colors. Black being the primer, earth and brown being the mid-tones. We'll eventually work up to uh, the lighter grays for the stone. So next layer, it's a slate gray. It's got a slight blue hint to it. It's still on the dark side. We apply it just like we applied the brown, a damp brush technique. We're trying to create almost a translucent layer on top of the brown. You're creating layers of color. It helps fool the eye into thinking that the object has its own depth, as opposed to just being flat foam. You want to stay away from the cracks and crevices. You don't want to ruin the shadow that the black primer is providing. Adding some white to our palette, we're going to lighten the slate gray to be our highlight color. Play with this. Sometimes you could work yourself all the way up to pure white as a highlight. It depends on what the look is you're going for. I want to keep this slightly on the darker side, so I'm not going to add as much white, but take a look. Again, with this lighter shade, definitely staying away from the cracks and crevices, tending to just touch the highlight areas of the model. Ink, whoa, oh crap, cap was open. Uh, so yeah, ink wash, totally an optional step, especially on a piece of terrain this size. It helps tie together all of the colors that you've used. It also lets you correct any mistakes you have made by getting a light color into a shadow area or Maybe you didn't stay away from those cracks and crevices like someone told you to do. Oh yeah, put something underneath the piece of terrain as you do this, else the wash will stick your terrain to your table, which is not good. Apply the wash to shadow areas. Let it flow. You'll see it'll, it'll create rivulets It'll follow the geography of your terrain. It looks cool. Alrighty, finally dry. Next task is to get a coat of varnish on this. 
I use the Minwax Polyurethane. It's inexpensive and it does a perfect job. I would not use the Evil Empire's super expensive varnish. That, that's you know typically what I'd use for my display miniatures. I wouldn't waste that much on a piece of terrain this size. And oh my God, it's like what, $20 a can? Unfortunately, the weather is not cooperating today. It's, it's been raining all weekend. I'm gonna wait till a sunny day before I give it a coat of varnish. And once it's varnished, then I'll put on some moss and grass, maybe make up some vines. Oh my God, that could be its own video. Here it is, all assembled in its epic glory. It's huge. I love it, I love it. My game group is going to have many hours, I mean, playing on this, this piece of terrain. It's awesome. I really believe this is now done. As done as this video is gonna get. Do the thing, subscribe, like, drop me a comment. Oh my God, I will reply to you if you drop me a comment. Thank you guys, I really enjoyed. I had a lot of fun with this. Until the next video, peace. Yes, honey? What sand? I don't know anything about any sand. Maybe it came from the beach stuff. I said beach. I, I, I don't know.